Okay, we're going to be just continuing in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. And Ephesians now, you know, we talked about a lot of doctrine in the first three chapters, which was, you know, the impact of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and the inheritance that we get as children of God. And now Paul, you know, as he's talking to the, you know, writing to the Ephesians, telling them that they're children of God and all these things they're getting, the last three chapters are more so practical applications and practical instruction of how to live the Christian life. So we'll go through four different sections here in Ephesians 4 this morning. Now the first section in this chapter is unity. Unity in the church. He says here in uh, Ephesians 4.1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So you can see there that he's getting now into practical instruction, exhorting the church to walk worthy of the vocation. So, you know, sometimes people talk about their vocation like their job, it's like your calling, what you're called to do. But obviously our calling as believers on Jesus Christ is to walk in the spirit, walk a godly Christian life. So he's saying here that you walk worthy of that calling, that vocation, that task, that responsibility you have as an ambassador. So note that it's, as a, it's not saying that you be worthy of it, because we know salvation is a gift, like we learned in Ephesians 2. It's, it's not by works, lest any man should boast. So you don't have to be worthy of the vocation, but you should wa walk worthy of the vocation, right? Like walk in a way, behave in a way, and act in a way that is worthy of what you are, right? Which is a saved believer, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 48. Look at this. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So we're not, we don't have to be perfect to be saved. That would be impossible. But as saved believers on Jesus Christ, we should be striving for perfection. Right? Don't get comfortable thinking, oh, you know, I'm not as bad as that person. Or, you know, you look at the world and you think, well, I'm not as bad as them. You know, that's not good enough just to be not as bad as them. You know, you need to be striving for perfection. You're always striving for more. You know, you shouldn't be content in your, you know, uh, like where you are spiritually. You know, you can, you can be content with the things you have, but, you know, always strive to, to improve in your spiritual life. Strive for perfection, like our Father in heaven is perfect. Ephesians 4.2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we see there lowliness, meekness. This is humility, isn't it? Long-suffering and forbearing one another. This is, you know, tolerance, tolerating one another. You know, when you spend enough time with a certain group of people, you, you might get on people's nerves, you offend one another, you, you know, things don't always go the way you expect or you rub each other the wrong way. So in order to have unity in a church, right, where you can come together and work together and serve together and be together, exist together in a body, what is it going to require? First and foremost, it requires humility. It requires tolerating one another. And verse number three, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You, you know, it requires effort to get along with one another, whether it's reaching out, to make friends, whether it's trying to resolve conflict, resolve contention. You know, sometimes in, in the world or even, you know, yourself in your life, you have contention with other people and sometimes you just throw your hands up and you just say, ah, who cares, right? No effort. But it requires effort to have this unity. We want to strive for unity in the body of Christ. It's what the Spirit wants. That's, that's one like sort of characteristic of a church. Do you, you know the Spirit of God is working in a church? Is how unified are they? How much do they love one another? And this is why he's saying, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So it starts with humility, isn't it? That's why it's with all lowliness and meekness. Look at Proverbs 13.10. Only by pride cometh contention. Isn't that interesting? So that's why any time there's a fight... Anytime there is contention between two people, the Bible says only by pride cometh contention. Right? Pride is always involved somehow in that contention. 
So that's why, how do you, how do you avoid contention? Well, it requires humility, isn't it? Why, why does pride create contention? Because, you know, you know people think, you know, when they, they lift it up, they, they're more easily offended. You know, how dare they say that to me? You know, how dare they treat me that way? You know, how dare they, you know, whatever. This is why pride is a reason why people are so easily offended. They expect people, you expect people to think your way. You know, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? It's like you expect them to do it the way you do it. So then now it becomes, you create conflict if it's not done in lowliness, meekness, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, you know, because you don't always measure up to each person's expectations. Or maybe arrogance. You know, like I said, that people can treat you like this or that. So a pride, and I'm sure there's a lot of other avenues that pride works to create contention, but you know, that's why humility and um, lowliness, meekness. Meekness is strength under control, they say. So meekness is not weakness. Sometimes people think meekness is just being a doormat, being walked all over. But no, meekness in the Bible is knowing your place. So it's, it's more like submission in terms of strength under control. You, you may have you know, more intellect or more power or more ideas or whatever, but you willingly submit yourself to know your place. That's um, what meekness is. So let's continue. So it requires humility. Verse 4 to 6, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So, of course, in order to have unity in a church, you need common values, don't you? And there are common values. So not only do you need the right attitude to have unity in a church, you have the common values. As one, we are of one body in Christ. It's one Holy Spirit. We have one hope, one salvation, right? One Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. One faith, the way our religion, right? One baptism, one God and Father of all. So we serve the same God who works, is above us, rules over us, works through us, and is in us. So this is an interesting verse, that God the Father is in us, like we would think the Holy Spirit dwells in us, but the Bible also says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So there's that trinity there of Father, Word, Holy Ghost. So we have these shared values and principles. It's the foundation of our unity. And obviously we have to have truth at the foundation of our unity. It's not just living at peace with one another without having shared values. That's not the way unity works in the Bible. We always want to be unified through the truth. James 3.17 But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. See that truth? That wisdom is first pure. It's first right. It's free from error then peaceable. So you see how unity always comes after truth. You don't have unity if you don't have truth. That's not true unity in the Bible. Gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So one thing to always remember when there's contention or there's division in a church over things, you know, we are coming together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have shared values, we have shared doctrine. Remember always that you know, we have a lot more in common than you realize. Do you know what I mean? Like one, what we have in common is so much greater than what we have different. And this is why I think when you do not have enough service in your Christian life, you know, where, what do I mean by service? You know, trying to reach other people preaching the gospel, soul winning, when you have an outward focus. See, when, when you come to church and you have an outward focus, the outward focus focuses you on the shared values, right? Because you are trying to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ and are trying to preach the doctrines of Jesus Christ. So when you have that outward focus, it brings church members together. Now they have this common goal, common enemy, common beliefs, right? But when you stop serving, right, and in your life your focus starts becoming inward, it's about what do I get from church? Am I happy? You know, what, what, you know, what are they doing for me? You know, it, it becomes more inward focused. Oh, I can't believe like, they treat me this way. And you, you, because you don't have that larger goal to put 
those differences aside for, against a bigger adversary, the differences and the contention starts becoming bigger. So that's why it's, it's very important that we remember that you know, we do have a lot more in common than we realize, even if you end up having contention with one another, that that can help you to overcome that. You, know, you, you may, you know, with a soldier in the, in the trenches, you, know, you may have differing ideals and things like that, but then they have a common enemy, don't they, that makes them work together and risk their lives for each other. And it's like that in the spiritual fight too. All right? Galatians uh, 5. We saw there in um, that we have uh, we don't want contention, right? Galatians five fourteen. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But look, if ye but if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. You see, division in the church is very dangerous, and it goes along with you know the tongue, and the tongue is a fire as division spreads throughout the church and sometimes the, the biggest enemy to a church is not necessarily from outside but it's from within and that division can sometimes just consume the church and you consume one another rather than you know being attacked by an outside enemy and it's a sad thing when you see uh, churches split not that, that churches dividing is necessarily a bad thing but just when they divide badly you know and there's a lot of damage done through contention and division all right, so that's one thing first that Paul is encouraging here in Ephesians chapter 4, is we want to strive for unity. It requires humility, it requires effort, it requires tolerance. But we have those shared values, right? And if we have an outward focus, it'll keep us focused on those shared values rather than the internal quabbles, which are generally smaller. Second section is Paul then goes on about gifts to the church that Jesus Christ has given to the church in order to help the church grow and to help that unity, help that service. Ephesians 4, 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, I don't believe here in Ephesians 4, in 1 Corinthians 13 and 14, talks about the gifts of the Spirit. I believe here in Ephesians 4, he's not talking about the gifts of the Spirit, but gifts of Christ, which are people given to the church. So Jesus Christ has raised people up you know, into different positions and different talents and abilities, and they are called here as gifts to the church. right? So the church didn't earn them. They're given to the church where Christ is using these people in order to build the church up. Um, I don't know what I want to say there. So it's referring to people gifted to the church to aid unity and spiritual growth. I don't think it's referring to gifts of the Holy Ghost. Let's go on in verse 9. Now that he ascended, so he's talking about Jesus Christ, yeah, he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So, so now in these brackets, he's referring to what Jesus did, right? Where he died, he's ascended, but before he ascended, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So this is a reference to Jesus Christ's soul descending into hell to pay for our sins. But it's saying the same person that is ascended up and he's the head of the church and he's giving gifts to the church is that same one, right? He's talking about humility and things. He descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So I think there's a connection here, right? The fact that he's above all, but then he humbled himself like in Ephesians 2, became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So uh, sometimes I wonder whether Paul puts this in here for us to reflect on, you know, you can have authority in a church, these gifts, these people in the church, but yet still be humble, right? Just like Jesus Christ was lifted up. He rules over all, but he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So... This is another verse that proves that Jesus Christ went to hell for our sins. He descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So here's the ascension in Acts 1.9. After he said they were going to be witnesses, he gives them the great commission in Acts 1. And it says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld the disciples, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So that's saying that's that man that was sent up into heaven. He's far above all things now. But this same man 
Acts 2.31, we're told when Peter's preaching about Psalms, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So that's what verse 9 and 10 in Ephesians 4 is referring to, that he descended first into the lower parts of the earth, which is descended into hell, and then he resurrected. Let's continue, Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some. So this is why I believe when he's talking about the gifts given to the church, because the theme here is about this Ephesian church and, and practical application for unity and spiritual growth. The gifts are referring to people. Because in verse 11, he says here, and he gave some. So this is what he's giving to the church to help unify them and to help build them up. Apostles and some prophets, because he gave churches different things. Some got apostles, some got prophets, some got evangelists, some got pastors, and some got teachers, right? Now, I don't believe we have apostles and prophets anymore in the strict sense of the word, in, the, in terms of the ones that reveal God's word, revelation. You know, we talk about people prophesying today, preaching God's word, which is a little bit different, like teaching God's word, but in terms of prophets, the ones specifically used to reveal God's word, right? So we had apostles, which are the ones chosen or ordained by the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that there was more than 12. Right? It was about 70, well, I guess you could say 82, because he ordained 70 others also, so maybe there was like 82 in total. Okay, some apostles, some prophets, and I think these last three roles are the ones that are more relevant to the New Testament today, evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So you see... Today, people use this word to refer to bishops in the Bible. So the offices in the Bible are bishops and deacons. So bishop is like an overseeing role, and deacon is like an administrative role within the church. We tend to, these days, a lot of people in you know, Baptist churches, they'll call the leader of the church a pastor, right? And then they get confused because pastor is not actually the office, the role that the person holds. Pastoring is something that you do. Right? So that's why you can, you can be an evangelist and not be a bishop of a church. You can be a pastor and not be a bishop of a church. And you can be a teacher and not a bishop of a church. So people, there are different people that teach in the church, like, you know, you know Gershon teaches in our church. What's a pastor? A pastor is like a mentor, isn't it? Somebody that leads sheep. So that's why people in a church can take up that role, whether officially or unofficially, where they are a mentor to somebody else. People look up to them. They look up to them as an example. That's what a pastor is. Now, bishops and deacons should be these things, right, to lead by example. But I'm saying that you don't necessarily have to be a bishop to be a pastor. And sometimes this is confusing because we say, like, pastors, you know, men, you know, people say that, pastors and men, men only preach in the church. So they think that pastors should only be men. Now, in the strict sense of the word, like the leaders in the church, that should be men. But that, does that mean that women can't be mentors to other people? Do you see? So if you think about a pastor in that sense, which is what the Bible really uses that word for, it's like mentors, then you understand that distinction biblically. You won't get confused. An evangelist, obviously, Philip was called an evangelist. These are people that go around and preach the gospel. So, of course, when you go soul winning, you're an evangelist. Right? Evangelists, evangelists is not like today. They're not like these Pentecostal preachers that go on a circuit preaching and slapping people on the forehead. That's what they kind of call evangelists today. But no, evangelists is somebody that preaches the gospel. So what is the purpose of these gifts? Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. So when I think of perfecting, I think of revealing sins, helping people to get sin out of their life. Right? You perfect the saints. You get rid of that, that, that tinge of, like, you, know, you know, I guess uh, these de the defects, right? our sins in our life. For the work of the ministry, what's that? That's evangelism, that's outreach, reaching people with the gospel for the edifying of the body of Christ. So I think this is both... So this is a bit different, I think, to perfecting of the saints. You think about getting rid of sin, but edifying the saints... Is about spiritual growth, isn't it? Doing more for God, learning more. See, that's not always just about getting sin out of your life. Right, so learning more, but also the physical growth of the church too. Obviously, hopefully the church grows physically as a body too. More people coming to church. Okay? 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So this is why Christ has gifted these roles, these people, to the church. And they, they can be men and women here. Ephesians 4, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he says there's that constant improving to unity and perfection. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So this is part of the heart of God, that he, that he is gifting teachers and evangelists and pastors and apostles and prophets to the church so that the church has some stability, some security in terms of not being taken away by false doctrine, by every wind of doctrine, not being tossed to and fro, by the slight of men. Why? Because there are people out there trying to take advantage of believers, teaching them false doctrine and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. This is why you have to know the Bible. But speaking the truth in love may grow up and into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So that's a good reminder for how we speak to people and how preachers should speak as well. They speak the truth, yes, but we always speak the truth in love. It's not just speaking the truth to, to cause damage. We want to speak the truth to edification. Like Paul says, he doesn't want to use his authority. He doesn't use his, want to use his words for destruction. He'd rather use it for edification. Right? So, you might be thinking, but, you know, the, these are people in the church. It's good to have people in the church to help us to learn. Yes. So, 1 John 2 tells us, and we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. So, you know, sometimes people use this verse and they say, oh, look, that's why we don't need pastors and teachers. We don't need people preaching the Bible. Just, just learn yourself and things like that. But that's, it's true in the sense that you don't need any man to teach you. It says here, you need not that any man teach you. But does that mean it doesn't help to have teachers and evangelists and good examples in your life? Of course it helps. Right? So... Ephesians 4 is not saying that you necessarily need these people for your spiritual growth, but they will help your spiritual growth, won't they? And that is why, you know, um, Christ has given these types of people to the church to help. So you can be a gift to the church if you, you know, fulfill one of those roles and help. Because it's not just, it's not just the responsibility of those in leadership to edify the church. And this is what we see in verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which, look at this, every joint supplier. So you see how every joint plays a part in the spiritual growth and unity and edification of the body. Are you doing your part? You know, I, you know, a lot of you guys know I, I do jiu-jitsu and stuff like that. And people, you know, there, people injure themselves all the time. Injure a finger, injure a toe, injure a shoulder, you know, and you know, they're not, they don't know how to take care of themselves. And you can obviously get injured doing any sort of sport. And when you injure yourself, that's when you realize the impact that that injury has on the whole body. You know, you, I, like one time I injured like my fourth toe, I jarred it doing something. And then it's like, you realize, oh, I didn't even, you didn't even realize you used that foot. Now, now it, you know, it affects your balance and things like that. And then uh, one guy, he, he was telling me he injured his shoulder. And then, you know, he can't do jiu-jitsu for now. He's going to take a few weeks off. He injured his shoulder. But he's saying he can't even jog now because he didn't realize, you know, when you move your arms, you're using the shoulder. So the Bible talks about this, that we're a body and you don't want schisms in the body because it impacts the whole body. But that's what I want you to think about right now as I preach on this point, is every joint supplies something to the body, which means if you're not doing your part, there's something missing in the body. You can be a hindrance on the whole body. And that's why you see that in groups of people where, you know, when people have contention or something goes wrong, it, it, it can impact the whole body. So you want to make sure that you are, you know, carrying your weight, doing your part, and not, you know, be that weak point, that, that weak link within the body, just like when you think about how your body works. All right, so, you know, reflect on that and, you know, may that motivate you to make sure that you are 
you know, stepping up to the plate and doing your part so that you are not a hindrance. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So we always have to remember, it's all done in love, speaking the truth in love, edifying in love. Because sometimes people forget, you know, they walk around, they're not meek, they're not lowly, and they walk around thinking, oh, you know, trying to correct everyone and things like that. I don't think we have that problem in this church, but that happens in churches. You know, where people think they are higher than they ought to, and then they don't do things in love, and, and that's always a problem, right? That can always cause more problems. All right? So, whilst preaching to the whole church may be a man's job, that doesn't mean women can't be teachers and evangelists and pastors in the sense of mentors, right? Not pastors in the sense of holding that leadership role. All right, let's go on. So we got unity in the church, gifts given to the church, which are these people that help unity, help to edify. And we all play a part in the edification of the church. Make sure you're doing your part so you're not a, there's no schism in the body. Third part is encouraging us to walk in the new man. To walk in the new man. So say, believers, you know, hey, strive for unity. There's, there's gifts given to the church people to help that unity. Now we get into the personal, they're all personal application, but here it's now you being encouraged to walk in the new man. Right? And in short, what he's saying here is don't be like a godless, unbelieving reprobate. That's what he's saying here. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. So Ephesians is obviously Greek, right? So he's talking to a Gentile church, and he's like saying to them, you know, you're saved, part of the body, part of the nation, Jew and Gentile, no more Jew and Gentile. And he's saying here, don't keep acting like the unbelieving world, right? Don't keep behaving like them. You know, walk worthy of the vocation where we are called, like he said in verse 1. That ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. So we see some of the attributes here of how the world walks, how the godless walk, how the reprobates walk, right? Having a vain life. Is your life vain? Can you think about what you're accomplishing with your life? Does it have eternal value? Or is your life vain? When you think about what will I accomplish at the end of my life, and if on judgment day it all gets burned up, that's a vain life. Is your life vain? They walk in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened. So obviously as you know, we're talking now, getting to reprobates here, right, where they're actually rejected of God, but he's saying don't, don't act like them, don't behave like them. What does that mean? Like they don't have an understanding of God. Their understanding is even darkened, but do you have an understanding of God? You don't want to walk like them. Walk with an understanding of God. Being alienated from the life of God, look at this, through the ignorance that is in them. So what are they like? They have nothing to do with God. They don't understand God. They're ignorant of God. They have, their life does not have, you know, gear towards God. That's how the godless reprobate walks. He's saying, don't you walk like that. Because of the blindness of their heart, are you, do you walk like you're blind, even though you've been saved? You know, I once was blind, but now I'm free. Who being past feeling. So this is the reprobate. They're past feeling. They don't even, they, their conscience is so seared, but we can see our own conscience. We just get comfortable living a vain life, living a life apart from God, living a life where we don't know the Bible, we don't know anything, we, we never do anything for God. We can get comfortable in that life. They're past feeling. It doesn't, it doesn't impact them anymore. They don't care anymore. And look, giving themselves over unto lasciviousness, what's that? That's just like a, like a hedonistic life of pleasure. You know, it reminds you of the thorns of the parable of the sower, cares of this life, pleasures of this life, the riches of this life, giving themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. So uncleanness, like fornication and just like even other unclean things in life. And greediness, materialism. So he is painting a picture here 
of the godless, unbelieving, reprobate and saying, don't walk as other Gentiles walk. But if you read this and this characterizes your life, you've got to change. You've got to change. You know, and walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. First Peter 4, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. And obviously it's impossible to completely cease from sin, but we're striving for that. Are you striving for that? You know, you've got bad habits in your life. You know, it's like we have smokers in our church. Are you striving to quit? Yeah, you know it's wrong, but is there even a desire to want to try and cease from sin? We, you know, so it's not just smoking and bad habits. I'm trying to put everyone in here. You know, you've got your sins. No, don't look at other people. They've got their sins. You've got your sins. Do you even have a desire to try and stop it? He that suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness and pleasure, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Here's what I like about this passage. Where, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Now, that's the sort of Christian life you want, where people of the world look at you and say, I, I, why would you not want to do this? How fun it is, everything. They think it's strange of you that, that you value things more than just living a life, vain life, full of pleasure. Who shall give account to him? Why? Because you know one day you'll give an account to God. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? So there's this encouragement here in Ephesians 4 to put on the new man. See, ye have not so learned Christ. You didn't learn the Christian life to live like that, to live a life vain and ignorant of God. If so be that ye have heard him, the word of God, and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. So yeah, we didn't learn from Jesus directly, but remember, we're learning from Jesus the word of God. And we learn from the Bible. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the former lifestyle of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Why are they deceitful? Because... Lusts deceive you, right? Like, like Solomon, deceive it. You know, you think you can handle it. Deceitful, you think you'll be happy. Deceitful, you think it's worthwhile eternally. Like, this is how lusts deceive you, right? And, uh, you know, unless you have an eternal, you, that eternal perspective, you won't be deceived. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, it's a different perspective, different way of thinking. And you put on the new man, which has after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So this new man, old man dichotomy, this is the spirit and the flesh, isn't it? And I always think that this putting on and putting off is a great analogy to explain sometimes to people why somebody who is saved may still look the same as they did before in terms of their actions and stuff, even though their spirit is born again. Because if you think of the old man and new man like clothing, and I say to people, well, you, you may be gifted a new uh, set of clothes, but if you never put it on, will anyone ever see it? You see? So the salvation is like you believe on Jesus Christ, you're given a new set of clothes. But if you don't put on the new man, people don't see it. You're always putting on the old man, because the two garments still exist. You as a believer still act like the world. Right? But if you put on the new man, people will see that new man, right? So this is that dichotomy in Ephesians 4 with the new man and the old man, which is what we learn in Galatians 5, the spirit and the flesh. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that ye would. All right, so this new man, old man, is like the new man's like a garment. If it's not worn, it won't be seen. It's a good way to understand you know, why a saved person. Because I mean, sometimes people, oh, that person's saved. Why does he still act like he was before when he wasn't saved? Well, it's because he's wearing the old man. Right? And if he puts on the new man, it's going to look like the old man. Right? Now, this last section, so we looked at walking in the new man. This last section, Paul now goes into just listing some practical ways to put on the new man practical ways to live a godly Christian life. 
some, some practical exhortation. Let's look at them, each one of them quite quickly. Ephesians 4.25 Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. So the first one is lying. You know, you don't say untrue things. Don't say untrue things about one another. You know, speak every man truth with his neighbour. Um, you know, maybe don't be, don't be fake. You know, be genuine in your Christian life. I mean, there's always a level of, and, and you know, there's a balance here, of course, where people, you know, sometimes the world will say things like, oh, you know, it's just got to be yourself, and then, you know, then you, you don't dress up for a job interview, and you don't, like, think about how you behave. And, I mean, obviously, there's a level of trying to cr create, you know, uh, be an ambassador for somebody, where you're not going to just let everyone know your deepest, darkest inner thoughts and just say, well, that's just it's me being genuine. You know, because part of you being genuine is trying to also be in a good example and things like that too. But you don't want to be so, so fake in the sense that what you try and exude outwardly is not really the level of where you are. And, and in a church, just like so put this into context, it, it, the typical example is like, you know, people come to church, hey brother, how you doing, praise the Lord, you know, like an independent Baptist church, hey, praise the Lord, brother, yeah. but then throughout the rest of the week, it's just, you know, you wouldn't recognize it. You know, are you that sort of Christian? Don't, don't be a one-day-a-week Christian where, you know, you come to church, you put on your church. And, you know, I'm not, you know, there's a balance here where, of course, when you come to church, you don't want to just be so genuine that you just, like, be a bad example to everyone at church. But I'm, but I'm saying, like, the, 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 the secret to being, being able to put on a genuine face at church is that you're like that throughout the week. You know, that you live a Christian life they say, you know, worship doesn't happen once a week on Sunday morning for 15 minutes when you sing songs. Worship is a lifestyle. Whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, whether you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So when you live a life where God is at the forefront, you're thinking about how God integrates with your life, and then when you come to church, it should just be another day for you. That's what you want to strive for. So... You can lie in that sense as well, where you, you know, you're not really who you make people to be that you are. And you know, sometimes people get caught out you know, when they see, see them outside of church. Right? So lying. Ephesians 4. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. So a couple of great things to learn here is, see, it is not wrong in and of itself to be angry. <coughs> So sometimes people think, like, you know, anger is a sin. No, anger is not a sin. The Bible says here, be angry and sin not, so which means it's you're able to be angry at things without sinning. Granted, anger does make it easier to go into sin, right? But that doesn't mean it's being angry in and of itself is sinful. So you can see here, you can be angry and sin not. So one of the bad things about where you may enter into sin with anger is unresolved conflict, right? When it says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, this is like saying, letting the days go on and things are not resolved, right? So unresolved conflict. So this is why people a lot use this verse for like couples. And they say, you know, you shouldn't go to bed before you resolve things. And they say, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath when they talk about going to bed. I don't really think it's talking about going to bed, but, you know, it's just saying that, you know, you have this conflict and it goes on throughout the whole day and you don't resolve it until, like, the sun goes down, right? So it's just talking about leaving things and not resolving them. So you should be resolving things. That's one problem with anger, right? But just note that neither give place to the devil as well because, see, anger in and of itself is not a sin, but it's whether it's unresolved is a problem but also if there's not a good reason for the anger. Matthew 5, 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So look, this is about anger without a cause, but also making sure you have, don't have unresolved conflict. Verse 23, Therefore... If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift.
gift. So you should keep that in mind when you serve God. You don't want to serve God with unresolved conflict. You know, resolve those conflicts. Get right with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and your service will be a lot more effective. Ephesians 4. So neither give place to the devil. How does anger, unresolved conflict, give place to the devil? Because it creates division in a church, doesn't it? We talked about striving for unity in the church. 2 Corinthians 2.10 To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Right, so not only does division cause damage in a church and reduces the effectiveness of your service and all that problems, but this is one tool that Satan uses to really get in and cause destruction. Right, so we need to be very careful with unresolved conflict, contention, and division. Ephesians 4.28. How we go on? <coughs> Stealing. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. So, you know, sometimes you read verses and, you, you, know, you know, we obviously live in quite a prosperous, more upper class kind of society. So we can't always relate to these sorts of things. But, you know, just because we don't always have, you know, the poorest of the poor, you know, people do steal in different ways. You know, because when you see, when you steal is when you don't work hard, right? When you work hard, you're less likely to steal. And obviously working is better than stealing. But sometimes when people don't work hard at their job, they don't do their job properly. That's like stealing from the boss. So that's why you've got to be working. If you're being paid for so many hours of work, you should do those hours of work. You do what you sold your labor for. Do you know what I mean? It's like if somebody came to mow your lawn at your house and you paid them 150 bucks or whatever, and, and then they, they missed parts and things like that. It's like they didn't do the job that you paid them for. Well, you've got to remember that as an employee, that you sold yourself for so many hours a week to do a certain task. You make sure that you're a good employee, that you don't steal, right? Because you're stealing things for you know, money when you didn't actually do the job that you were paid to do. So that's why being a good employee is about being an honest Christian as well. Now, if you work hard, it says here, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needed. So not only if you work, you won't have to be poor and steal, right? Well, they, a lot, obviously the poorer people will steal, um, most of the time. But the harder you work, therefore you have more to give as well. And the Bible has instructions on those that have money. First Timothy 6, 17, Look, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So the harder you work as well in your job, the more you can earn, the more generous you can be with your time and with your money too. Let's go on. A couple more verses. So we've seen a few practical applications. Lying, anger, stealing. Now he goes on to speech. Ephesians 4. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which, is to the, that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. This is one of our memory verses that we'll have in part of the kids' club, talking about speech, how we talk. You know, we should get swearing out of our vocabulary. There's even some words that I say that I would think, like, oh, I shouldn't be saying those things. So, you know, we shouldn't have these sorts of words in our vocabulary, of corrupt communication. Let's speak with love. Let's speak with respect. You know, we want people to know. And, and then th these days, you know, people tend to notice people that don't swear because everyone swears these days. And uh, if you don't swear as a Christian, like people will notice that, that you have a higher standard of communication and speech. But how does the way you speak tie in? Because there's an and there at the beginning of verse 30. It says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So, you know, that is a verse on eternal security where, you know, even if we have some of these sins, even if we grieve the Holy Spirit, we're sealed unto the day of redemption. This is eternal security right there. We have um, assurance of our salvation. But we can grieve the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. 
And I think, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that these are one after the other and then there's an and. I think these are tied together. And the reason why I think they're tied together, what, what is the Holy Spirit? If you remember, the Holy Spirit's the Word of God. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You, know, you don't want the, the good treasure in your heart to come out. So you speak, you know, the Word of God and, and, and you don't grieve the Holy Spirit by having what? Corrupt communication. So this is why I think you want the good treasure coming out of your heart from the Word of God as opposed to the corrupt communication from the Word, from the world and from the sin. So this is the parallel passage in Colossians 4. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you, know, how you ought to answer every man. So this is always a good principle on speech because it's saying here we want more grace in our speech seasoned with salt. So like your food, you just put a little bit of salt on there. If sometimes speech that is only salt can cause damage. You know, too much salt can be lethal. Right? Too much salt can be abrasive. So how should we speak this is a good principle. It should be more grace and less salt. Salt referring to like truth. Right? Truth is usually a bit harder to take and therefore you, we season it on grace. Right? Grace should be the majority of our speech. But why then does it grieve the Holy Spirit when we have corrupt communication? Well, there's this verse here in James 3 that it made me think of, where it talks about our tongue in James 3. But it says, With our tongue, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. So it's the same fountain, it says here, bringing forth two different types of things. And I think that's what God does not want, that's what grieves the Holy Spirit. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. So this is why corrupt communication grieves God, because the, the mouth that he made for you to praise God, to preach the gospel, to say, speak the truth with love, saying corrupt things. Out of the mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, look at this. These things ought not so to be. And the last two verses, Ephesians 4, 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So I think he kind of finishes this chapter here. Remember this chapter was about being unified in the body, people given to the church to edify and unify unity of the spirit and the bond of peace unity and perfection in jesus christ and then some practical exhortation that can create contention right anger the way you talk you know lying to one another this is all sins that he's sort of pointing out that is causing this division and this last one he points out here bitterness wrath it's like malice you know, it's like having actual evil intentions or wanting to seek revenge. And then he ends the chapter with to remind them of God's love. That, you know, we talked about you know, last week, you know, that God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that really should be the driving force of why we want unity in the church and why we can be humble and why we won't want to get revenge and we can love our enemies because we are kind one to another and tender-hearted forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So I'll just end it here on this verse, John 13, 34. Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So a nice consistent theme through Ephesians 4, and then Ephesians 5 and 6 will have more practical application. But just to re-summarise, re, um, re so unity in the church. Unity in the church is important. Number two, gifts to the church. So we all play a part in the unity and edification of the people here. Right? Are you doing your part? Walk in the new man. Our spiritual life can impact the church. So you don't want to be worldly. Don't, don't act and be like the ungodly, unbelieving, reprobate world. Right? The reprobates of this world who are past feeling. You know, don't be comfortable in that state. 
And the last one is the practical exhortation. So follow the practical advice given in God's word. And then some books like this, like Ephesians, there are other books like this where there's just like list of practical advice. Those ones are really great because you can get some really good guidance on what it means to live a godly Christian life with the love of Christ. All right? So I hope that was a blessing to you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his love. Help us to have the love of Christ. And I pray that, Lord, um, the love we have for one another will be the mark of our church. This by this shall all men know that we're your disciples. We have love one for another. So help us, Lord, help us to play our part in the church, to, to be unified and to um, help each other grow. And uh, Lord, I just pray that, um, you know, help us to leave different people and help us to be not just hearers of the word, but doers only, doers also. So we thank you, we pray in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.